Thank you very much for joining us today as we engage in a very timely discussion titled Sizing the Moment, Opportunities for Peace and Growth in Colombia. As many of you know, Colombia has been in the news recently after 52 years of a bloody armed conflict and more than five years of talks between the Colombian state and the FARC, the country's largest leftist rebel group in efforts to achieve peace. We have heard diverse views during this process and with today's discussion, we hope to gain greater insights on this historic moment. We are honored to welcome the Ambassador of Colombia to the United States, Juan Carlos Pinzon. Juan Carlos Pinzon presented his letters of credence to the President of the United States on August the 3rd, 2015. Throughout his career, Ambassador Pinzon has been a leader in both the public and private sectors. Most recently, Pinzon serves as Minister of Defense of Colombia for nearly four years. Prior to serving as defense minister, Pinzon was chief of staff to President Juan Manuel Santos from 2010 to 2011, and vice minister of defense from 2006 to 2009. In 2011, the World Economic Forum selected him as a young global leader. He has also held positions as senior advisor to the executive director of the World Bank, vice president of the Colombian Banking Association, Assistant Vice President of Investment Banking at Citibank, Private Secretary and Chief of Staff for the Ministry of Finance and Economies for Colombia at Citigroup. He holds a Master's of Science in Economics from the Pontificia Universidad Javeriana in Bogotá, and he was awarded a scholarship to receive his Master's in Public Policy from Princeton University's Woodward Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. So please uh, help me in welcoming the Ambassador. I will hand over to Father Matthew Carnes, uh, the director of the Georgian Center for Latin American Studies. He's gonna be guiding and moderating the uh, conversation. Let me give an uh, introduction of Father Carnes. He's an associate professor in the Department of Government and the, at the, uh, and the Edmund Walsh School of Foreign Service. He currently serves as the director of the Center for Latin American Studies. His research examines the dynamics of labor and social welfare policy with particular interest in the ways societies protect their most vulnerable members, the old, the young, the ill or injured, and the unemployed. His principal regional focus in Latin America, and in recent years, he has conducted extensive field research in Argentina, Peru, Chile, and Bolivia. His teaching has been highly decorated. In 2012, he was featured as one of the country's best professors in the Princeton Review publication, 300 Best Professors. And in 2013, he was chosen by students as the faculty member of the year in the uh, Walsh School of Foreign Service. So for further ado, I uh, think that, uh, Father, you wanna take it from here? Thank you. It, it's just wonderful to have um, Ambassador Pinzon with us at this incredibly important moment um, in the history of Colombia at this really decisive moment um, in both the process of peace and the process of growth in that country. So our uh, uh, program today will consist first of some opening remarks um, from Ambassador Pinzon, about 20 minutes or so of opening remarks. Then he and I will have an exchange, a conversation for about another 15 or 20 minutes, and then we'll open it up to conversation from the entire um, uh, um, body assembled here. And it's great to see so many people. It really speaks to how important these issues are and how much Georgetown cares about these issues and is involved in the country of Colombia in particular. So without further ado, Ambassador Pinzon, I'll let you um, open with some remarks. Thank you, Father. Well, first of all, buenas tardes a todos. Because I think here is more Colombians and Venezuelans I've seen and other friends than from any other country. But I will speak in English anyway, you know, just for the purpose of uh, keeping the protocol. It's an honor to be here, Georgetown. This continues to be one of the most important schools, and I have to tell. Uh, many very relevant and uh, important Colombians have uh, come to the school. Uh, I, I can recall some of them that have been very relevant in the policy discussion in Colombia, 
and in the private sector and public life, you know, they have been very successful. So you have a group of alumni from this school that is very well connected to, to Colombia on every level. Not to forget that on the recent peace process, Georgetown and some of its professors have been always uh, active and have been always trying to be part of the discussion and support you of the efforts. So I think we should thank you for that. And of course, there's another connection for me to Georgetown, which is my own alma mater in Colombia, Universidad Javeriana. This is the you know, most important connection we have in the United States, Georgetown University. So Father, don't ask me why you didn't come to Georgetown then, you know, <laughs> but here I am today. Uh, it's a great opportunity to speak on, about Colombia. And every time I think about the honor I have to speak on behalf of my country and to explain the history of my nation and what have we trying to do the recent decades, and where do we think we should be moving to the future, I cannot feel a higher privilege. I'm speaking to you students, first of all. You should aim to love your country, and you should aim to work hard to represent your country as best as you can. I'll try to do my best today, as every time I can speak about Colombia. Sometimes people forget about the size of Colombia and a little bit of the context of the country. Colombia, let's not forget, is not a small country. It's the size of California, Texas, and you can even put New Mexico there. For other metrics, you can put uh, France and Spain into Colombia. So it's quite a sizable country. Then when you think about numbers of people, population, you know, according to the census estimates, we're getting to 49, we're 48 and something, let's say 50 million. But anyway, it's already the third most populated country in Latin America and the second Spanish speaking country by population in the world. So it's not a small country, you know, nor by size, nor by population. Not to forget about natural resources. It's a country rich in natural resources. It's a green country, not because we suddenly are into climate change, which we are as well, but because we are a green country, in fact. You know, it's a country full of jungles. It's a country that has a big responsibility in the Amazon basin. And it's a country in which mainly all the water that we have in the northern part of South America, you know, comes out of Colombian mountains somehow. So I think that's very important. According to some experts, Colombia is the second largest country in fresh water when you put that in per capita terms after Canada and after us Brazil and then the United States. So it's quite important when you think about the future. Others have uh, declared Colombia as the third most biodiverse country in the world, which was a nice honor to have and very important if you believe in you know, uh, the importance of the environment and the importance of natural resources. But now that we can be coding everything DNA coding, suddenly we're rich, or we might reach some years from now. I'm just trying to portray the importance of that kind of wealth when you think about the perspective. I kind of describe this because then we need to get onto another realities on the political and economic side, and then the challenges we have confronted, and how do we overcome those, and where we are today, and where we should be going. So on those facts, Colombia is the only uh, economy in Latin America that has never defaulted. And that's not a minor issue. When you think about a country that despite all the suffering we had, particularly in the 80s and 90s, we were able to continue to grow. We were able to continue to move on. I think that talks well from Colombian entrepreneurs and innovative attitude, but on the other side, of a prudent, well-managed policies on the economic side. And not to forget that we have been, uh, for years now, the longest standing democracy in Latin America. That's interesting to see, because as we were the longest standing democracy, it's true as well that we were the only country, as we speak, that still has a conflict. So it's those kind of interesting features that we have. 
that uh, you have a very prudent and very good economic management, but never have a spectacular year. And on the other side, you have the longest standing democracy, but at the same time, we keep still a conflict that we're trying to solve hardly, particularly in the past decade and a half. By telling you this, let me remind you that we made a major effort by the end of the 90s, especially at the beginning of this century. The country has been seeking peace forever. And on the years I've been part of public life, or even as a regular citizen, I can tell that every government that I know has been trying to do a peace agreement with someone. We have had six peace processes that have been successful already. With the M19, the CRS, the, EP, the EPL, Quintin Lame, ERG, and I may be forgetting another one, AUC, <laughs> those six. With the FARC, we have tried five peace processes. Four of them failed. And only one, as of today, has been uh, resulted in an agreement, the current one. I think that's important to look at. So since we have been trying to make peace for a long time, on every president, on every government, that has been a national objective. Of course, by the end of the 90s, there was a major effort to that. But then the country came to the conviction that that was going to be impossible. Impossible if we had the level and size of power coming out of different guerrillas, drug traffickers, AUC, paramilitary, yes, so-called. So that's when the country made a very important set of decisions. First, make part of our discussion what it was, a little bit of an international discussion, because it's true that drug trade resulted in the gasoline for crime, violence, and corruption in Colombia. That is a fact. But the other truth was that consumption was not happening in Colombia, essentially. It was happening in the largest markets in the most powerful economies in the United States. So here's where Colombian government, at the time, decided to look out, come, and express the problem of an almost failed state. That was the truth of Colombia 1999, 1998, 2000. We were a failed, uh, a failed nation, unfortunately. 30% controlled by guerrillas, 30% with presence and control by uh, 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 illegal defense forces, self-defense forces, and 30% in which the state was trying to uh, achieve its uh, objectives. So the fact of getting to the US, presenting the case, and explaining the need for co-responsibility to change the reality of that failed nation led to what was known later as Plan Colombia, a plan that became very useful, very important, and somehow from US policy perspective, maybe one of the few that can be called as successes. I don't want to quote or to be quoted by this, but I'm just trying to paraphrase some of what uh, experts are saying about Colombia and about Plan Colombia. Plan Colombia enabled Colombian institutions, and I think that was an important element. It was not an intervention from the United States in Colombia, or it was not a case in which the United States was going to take the role of Colombia, but was, as Colombians, responsible to reclaim our country, to take it back, to confront our challenges, and to seek for a better future. And then we found a good friend, the United States providing certain capabilities on three fronts, security. And those security, we got some technologies that allowed our intelligence, our special operations to strengthen, to become more effective. And of course, we were able to raise the standards of our military and especially the education and human rights that allow us to become a more legitimate state and let the armed forces to be, in essence, very poorly respected by the end of the 90s to have today probably the most respected institutions in Colombia when you see it any, any poll. The other part was development. So the presence of USAID was very welcome. Sure, we knew that the country has not been integrated forever. 
That might explain why Colombia was such a large country and we have been just losing territory time by time by time by time because we didn't exercise our territorial control the way the state should. And we didn't offer to the people of those territories enough probably opportunities. Still, that's true. But the presence of USAID helped us to clarify the way in which we were uh, in need to take different agencies of the state rather than just the security forces to provide other options and solutions. And finally, I think the fact of strengthening justice became very important. In Colombia, we have seen go, go to jail many people, many important people. More than 30 members of Congress have come to justice by corruption, by nexus with drug trafficking, or by nexus with any of the illegal armed groups, uh, AUC, or even the FARC. And that has been very important. That has had consequence in the sense that the state uh, operated. What I can tell you about the Colombia of today is that the country had a progress. I am not one of those who like to call for success. Success is something that maybe nations can claim after many generations. There's no way I can, I can claim success. I see a lot of challenges. I see that we will have to confront a lot of important efforts and endeavors in the years to come. But the country really transformed from that failed nation of the end of the 90s, early century, to the country that we have today. Security improved. We were able to degrade every source of violence in the country. Let's talk about the FARC. FARC resulted in 30% of what they were in manpower, resources, or uh, uh, weapons. And I can tell a little bit of the same of the other threats of the country. Homicides this year will be probably the lowest in four decades, in 40 years. And that's very significant to tell. There's one of the Mexican universities, one of the prestigious ones that every year comes with a study of the most violent cities in Latin America. Because let's not forget, that's a shame. We're a peaceful region. We don't have wars among ourselves, but we are the most violent region in the planet, Latin America. That's a challenge for, 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 to, to study. And because of that, uh, this university publishes every year which are the top 10 uh, 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 most violent cities in the region. Since that was published, something like five, six years ago, every year at least three Colombian cities were in. Of course. Last year, for the first time, for the first time, no single Colombian city is in the top 10 of the most violent cities of Latin America. And that's substantial. I insist, I'm not saying we're out of challenge. I'm not saying that drug trafficking is going to vanish uh, because of our efforts of what we're doing right now. On the contrary, it's a challenge, illegal mining or others, but I'm saying there's a trend and there's an effort that has resulted in consequence. Then you look at the economy. Colombian economy has been able to attract investors. In per capita terms, for the year 13 and 14, we were the country that obtained more investment than any other in the Western Hemisphere, I mean Latin America. And of course, investment resulted in reduction of unemployment. Unemployment has been in a single digit after being 21% by the year 1998, 1999, to a single digit for five continuous years every month. We still have had a single digit of unemployment. And of course, the economy has been growing, although strongly hit recently by uh, the oil shock. Colombia became uh, too much funded coming out of oil the past 10 years. And of course, when oil prices came down and there's some kind of oil reduction, demand reduction in the United States, Colombia was harmed. And we lost a little bit of the growth uh, level that we had for 4% average for 10 years to, let's say, 2.5% average the past two. But still, the economy is growing with higher numbers than most of the economies of the region, which shows some resilience and some uh, effectiveness of the policies. And to end, of course, more important than all, the consequences in social indicators. 
Colombia was able to cut poverty in a decade by half, from 52% of poverty to 27% of poverty. Is 27% poverty a high number? Absolutely yes, it's a very high number. But look where, we, where are we coming from and how important it has been to reduce that. How we did it, of course, security led to investment, investment led to economic growth. But then economic growth led to having uh, more funding for social programs and social policies. So there have been specific programs on housing, on uh, early childhood education, on elementary and uh, uh, super schools education, and other programs, including infrastructure. You know, the main important program we're developing right now is our largest infrastructure program in, I would say, three decades. Those things are enablers to keep hoping for, you know, a stronger future. Let me get into what many of you are coming for, which is peace process. And I will not talk so large about it because I know some of the questions will come onto that front. What I can tell you is the following. We came to the peace process uh, in a position of strength for the first time, really. And that explains why, anyway, we were able to uh, not only put the FARC to negotiate in Havana, but somehow achieve an agreement. On agreements, you can ask to have a better agreement or stronger agreement, or depends who you talk with. But the truth is that for the first time, we got an agreement. I think that was important. In that process, let's not forget that President Santos was not always seen as a dove. Totally the contrary. He was elected as a hawkish president because he was a very effective hawkish minister of defense. The first time we were able to hit the leadership of the FARC was under his uh, time as Minister of Defense during President Uribe's administration. When he came to become president, we continued to hit them. Under our watch, we saw for the first time ever to uh, fall down the top leader of the FARC and the top military leader. And I can testify the achievement of the Armed Forces of Colombia during my time in which I saw 55 leaders of the FARC to be taken out of combat. So that was the approach and the way we were able to, to, to create the environment for this, the climate for this. Then, of course, the president decided that getting to the dialogue, but also managing the tools of force using ceasefire and other tools as signals to create the climate for an agreement was his authority and his decision. And those are things that he was uh, able to perform. To at the end, as I said, reach an historic uh, result, which was having an agreement for the first time with the FARC after five intents on different governments. I believe it's also important and fair to tell that he made a decision that even many experts criticize. He decided that whatever agreement he had, he was going to take it to the public. Well, you can criticize that now that you know the result, but you can never criticize the will to make democracy operate and the trust in democracy. It's sad to see that, you know, that's what we want for everyone and not, ever, not in every place is happening. In Colombia, the president, without having the obligation to take the agreements to the public, decide and promise during his reelection campaign that that was going to happen, and he did. It's important to look for polls everywhere, <laughs> not only in Britain, not only in Colombia, but I guess everywhere. In Colombia, the polls a week before were showing, even the conservative ones, nine points ahead for the yes uh, against the no. Nine points. Was not two, was not three, nine. 
That Sunday, October 2nd came, and the results were the following. 63% of Colombians didn't show up, so there was no vote or abstention. Very common in mature democracies or in democracies that have you know, regular access, even happens in the United States. You know, the abstention is quite high as compared to, to, to other countries. And then 50.2% of Colombians that voted, voted for the no. 49.7% of Colombians that voted, voted for the yes. In conclusion, the president came out and explained that the plebiscite was lost and that according to the ruling of the Constitutional Court, those agreements could not be implemented anymore. Several comments out of this. The first, the strength of Colombian democracy. We tested. We tested our democracy and we proved it's strong. Such a decision was uh, taken and there we are. And we have a result and simply things cannot move as they were planned. Second, the strength of institutions. The consequence of this was not uh, ousting the president or ousting the government or closing the Congress or you know, going and declare fraud. On the contrary, the president's first reaction was to announce that his first responsibility is institutional stability, that he was going to guarantee that. And second, the opposition even said and came out and explained that the only person that has in Colombia the legal authority to make a peace agreement is the president. So instead of having now a, a parallel negotiation with the FARC, everybody recognized that it's the president and the current set of institutions that need to be uh, working out. President offer uh, to listen and to open a dialogue with every different sectors and leaders that uh, oppose to his agreements and to his policy. And he has been doing that, taking more than 400 of recommendations and using those recommendations to, of course, go and discuss with the other side, with the FARC in this, guy, in this case, for the purpose of a new agreement. And I underline the word new agreement. That's the effort right now. Doesn't mean that the previous agreement is not going to be considered. Maybe a lot of what is there is going to be included. Maybe most of it, maybe part of it, maybe a lot. But what matters is that the government is working for a new agreement and that the president continues to have the legal powers that any president of Colombia has to perform a political agreement and to move forward with different sets of alternatives from an ordinary process to consult the population again. That's where we are right now, and that's where the debate is. Final reflection is that not only we have a strong democracy, we have a strong set of institutions, but I think we have an opportunity. I can tell you that you know, I've been, of course, interested on public life since I remember, even because I came from a family that was of public servants, so whatever happened in public life was important in the, my dining table every night. And then I became myself a public servant. And I, to and I took roles and responsibilities. And I can tell you that for many years, we always thought about options to solve this problem. The use of legitimate force or different sources to solve the problem. And frankly speaking, that's what explains the heroism and sacrifice of our soldiers and policemen where we are. There's no other ways we could be here. But by saying that, after the plebiscite for the first time ever, I see every player in Colombia, including the illegal actors, only talking of one alternative, making peace through dialogue, making peace through agreement. Everybody is talking about peace. Not everybody is praising the agreements. I'm not saying that. That's going to be a very challenging political effort. It's what democracies are about, and it's what politics is about. It's discussing, it's finding common grounds, and it's not going to be easy. I will never suggest that. But I'm saying we're in front of a great opportunity for Colombia. 
I don't expect that the new agreements later will have 100% of support. That doesn't happen in democracies. God bless, God forbid. That, that's impossible. There's no way that everybody just agrees with everything. I think that the agreement that we were gonna reach sometime from now will have a lot of people supporting and many people with differences on the contents. That's what happens. But the opportunity we have now is to have more Colombians, hopefully as much as we can, hopefully all the sectors, pushing for the same objective of having a better set of agreements than the ones that were reached already, and now really moving to uh, implement and execute peace in the years to come, which by the way, is a big challenge. And will demand as much concentration as we had to transform the country from the most violent one to where we are, will require the same commitment and the same effort. And all these Colombians that are studying abroad, coming back to the country, don't stay here, don't stay here, no way. We need you there. We need you there because we will have to confront a major challenge to make the country work and to achieve uh, the next level. That is what we hope. Thank you so much. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, please. So Ambassador Pinzon, thank you so much for those uh, comments which put the Colombian uh, uh, situation in context give us a sense of the long trajectory towards peace and uh, especially of growth and dynamism in recent years. And then I appreciate you turning our attention most uh, to the most recent uh, developments there, both in the, um, the peace accord and then in the referendum, and both which were um, uh, so much of what drew us, drew so many of us to this room today. Um, as you mentioned, Georgetown students are intimately involved in this. So we've had Georgetown students working in uh, various offices on the peace process, in human rights efforts, in conflict resolution, and we've had Georgetown students working in entrepreneurship and enabling that whole access, that whole um, uh, kind of economic and social inclusion that the country would like to see. So Georgetown is intensely interested in this. The question I'd like to put to you to follow up on this is a something of an academic one, only in, the context, only in the sense that here we are in a university, and one of the things I often push my students to do is to learn lessons, you know, to sort of take what are the lessons we can draw from an experience. And I want to ask you about lessons sort of in three ways around the experience of the negotiations that led up to the peace accord, the, and the referendum itself, and then the result of the plebiscite. And really, I, I'd be interested if you could speak to the lessons that have been learned in terms of peacemaking, um, it's interesting, you know, today uh, discussions are beginning unless they got held up for some reason with the ELN, right? So another set of peace negotiations. Is there something you learned from these peace negotiations, which now you need to continue with the FARC, but is there something you learned there, maybe in terms of transitional justice, maybe in terms of social inclusion, but in that kind of negotiation? Are there lessons you drew there specifically? You think, here's something we would draw with another um, armed combatant group. Second, is there a political lesson you learned? Um, because in this process, putting this up for, uh, um, for election really said, can we persuade the people, can we encourage the people to participate in a way that they'll really um, uh, believe in this? And we saw it was still a divided um, nation. And we see voices that have very different views of how they'd like to see this process carried out. What did you learn about the ways democracy works, and especially about consensus building, because that's the next step. So you know, students will be dedicated to that. What could they learn from this? And maybe third, since we really pitched this around seizing the opportunity, not just for peace, but for growth, what do you think are the lessons that we should take away in terms of the next stage of economic opportunity, economic development? What should business people be paying attention to here? What do you think are the next steps business-wise as well? Does this subvert the process that was, going to, that was moving towards um, a, so a more stable country in which we'd see lots of investment? Or does this, does this maybe open up new opportunities? So you know, what are the, the lessons? And if you could touch on each of those, I think it would be interesting just to maybe touch on each of those three areas that you have such experience in and maybe we can learn from. Well, thank you, Father. Uh, hard, hard to conclude at this stage. I think we are in a process and I think uh, it will take some time to really extract all the right set of lessons to really understand the current political process and, and see where we end. But there are some things that are already in place that I believe are important. 
the first that I believe we learn in Colombia is that you only make peace when you set the incentives to the other side to, don't ha to not have any other option. And this I'm going to be very transparent. Without the efforts and the way far degraded to what they are today, that explains why previous peace processes, four of them, failed. Because they always thought they had a better option. This time they know they don't have a better option. And I think that was the consequence of a well thought policy that uh, included three governments, that was sustained, that requires the recognition you know, of many leaders of the country and, and the country as, it's, uh, uh, as, as a whole, pushing for the same agenda for the uh, security consensus that I believe was achieved uh, in the past 15 years. That was a key condition. Without that, of course, you can talk on, on, on all the elements of uh, peace building, but peace building was not going to be feasible without the conviction that through the use of violence and weapons, they would never get uh, uh, to power. So, you know, getting to that uh, objective conviction was critical. From then, from there, uh, I think that uh, a lot of realism re re is, is required to this. And in that regard, I think that trying to understand the set of conditions that are in the marginal areas of Colombia is important. And not allow that to be the speech of certain ideologies or extreme sectors in the political spectrum. But understanding that when we talk about poverty and marginal areas of the country and bringing those who are in need to be embraced is not a, let's say, extreme left wing uh, point of view. It is a state view, should be everybody's view, should be a policy effort. I think that's important. And that probably allow to get into a discussion of very pragmatic points in the negotiating agenda. I think that was important. That's what allows to discuss, OK, let's discuss on how we handle justice, how we, ha we handle political participation, how we handle uh, the problems on land and agricultural development in the country. I think that's a little bit of what created that possibility for, for the side of the government. So probably the lesson there is, you know, talking about poverty and talking about how to solve problems for people in need shouldn't be an ideological agenda. It should be, you know, a solution that requires to be uh, confronted. On the justice side, the transitional justice discussion, it's a matter of incentives. You might prefer to see many of these gentlemen 40 or 60 years in jail for the atrocities they commit. Whomever committed those atrocities, whatever the color, they deserve it. But then if you're asking them two things, give away your weapons and resign forever to crime. And if you go to crime, we will go after you. That's a little bit of the three set of uh, elements of discussion. You need to offer them a set of incentives that allows them to make that a good option. If they don't think it's a good option, what will happen is that they will say, OK, come for me. I'm here. I, I, I can stand. I can, I can be powerful enough. So this is why transitional justice, of course, portrayed in a very reductionist way, as I just did, in a very simplistic way, is so important. And I think that's a process in which Colombia is getting to know and getting to learn. It's not easy. And I will not explain today why no one or why we got the result we, we, we got. Very hard to get to that conclusion. But what is not, uh, or what is probably considered a fact in Colombia is that the level of trust that these organizations, Far Gillen and other criminals have in the Colombian people is very low. And it's very low because of what they did, because of the crimes and the behavior they had. So any progress we do on to offering this set of uh, incentives crosses by the idea that they need to win the credibility of Colombian people because their credibility is too low. And I think that's a, a, an important lesson as well. Uh, they need to show not 
theatrical events to provide or to prove that they are willing, but people need to really feel and understand that's a fact. I think that's another lesson. And the other political lesson, but I guess is uh, an important one, is uh, uh, hard to conclude yet, but uh, well, people today, in the world of social media, in the world of absolute access of information to anyone that has a tool, uh, cannot be just conducted as we thought before. You know, in politics, some leadership and some ideas were somehow running people to, uh, uh, to the polls, to, to put it in a way. And in my opinion, that's uh, an issue that is starting to be more and more, uh, at least requires analysis. Uh, people is more informed than we know and have their own views and every Harry has an opinion and they express it. And you need to you know, understand that precisely in order to reach to the citizen and not only to the uh, intermediaries of uh, public opinion creators, but really reach to the citizen. Those are you know, just thoughts that I'm bringing you today uh, from, from what we just saw. No, thank you, that's, that's very helpful. Um, uh, so recently I visited Bogota this last um, summer and I had the opportunity to meet with the uh, director of USAID. And one of his uh, observations was he really felt that in Colombia, he said there are really dos Colombias, um, two Colombias, you know, that are quite divided, um, socioeconomically, regionally, um, uh, in some cases their experience of violence or not their experience of violence. And this was profoundly concerning to him, even though at the time he expected that the peace accord would, would pass and would pass the, the plebiscite. Um, how do you think we think about that sort of, of division? And is it a level of polarization or is it something other than that? And, and I think quite rightly, you could uh, throw that question back at me at the United States, which is also a country where we see a lot of I was going to division, yes. All right. Um, uh, but uh, how, do you, how should we think about this especially, but it seems to me the divisions are slightly different between the United States and, and, and Colombia. I mean, and they have some different uh, dimensions to them. So how would you think about that? Do you think he's right to say there are dos Colombias? And if he is, or if he's wrong, how would you correct him? Well, I don't know why he said there are two Colombians or you know, what are the causes he sees, but I'm gonna tell you from my own experience of probably being one of those Colombians that traveled the country more than, than average. It's true there are some two Colombians, you know, in 140 municipalities of Colombia, you don't have the middle income country that Colombia is and the progress and opportunities that are around. With all the challenges and restrictions that as society we have, but when you go to cities like Bogotá, Medellín, Barranquilla, Bucaramanga, Cali, so many big cities and, and other intermediate cities that we have, they are somehow seeing progress. There, you know, some job creation. The consequence of private investment and public investment is more visible, despite the challenges. But somehow there's some agenda of progress. When you go to those 140 municipalities, in which Unfortunately, you know, there are not so many Colombians, which is good news because it's not such a large population, so maybe we can handle that. But it's bad news because sometimes, precisely because there are not so many people, uh, as compared to the cities, they cannot be here uh, politically. Yes, you find people that is uh, in a different era than the rest of Colombia. And that's the way I will see the two Colombias, you know. A Colombia of two million people approximately with 140 municipalities that is really uh, with lacking of much of the services. I said before, social services, infrastructure, uh, justice services, education services, healthcare services. I mean, everything is lacking or is uh, uh, in need. While you see the rest of Colombia, an average middle, middle income country that especially the past 10 years is even uh, performing better than others. So that's where I see the, the, the difference. And a big challenge. When I said at the end, uh, we need all these Colombians to come back is because we need first to push this middle income country to the next level. But then to attach that rest of the country to the country that is moving. And, and it's so easy to describe and say it, but this is a real challenge. How do you do that? And you know, and we will need the very well educated people, good minds, and, and a lot of uh, pragmatism and realism. Not to forget, 
these jobs would you know, make, make the opportunity. So you said in the economy at some point, tell me what do you think in the economy to the future? Uh, I think in those areas are opportunities, but need to be handled uh, efficiently from uh, the perspective of policy management. So first of all, we need to make the country as attractive as we can to investors. And we might not be doing that as well as we did uh, uh, before. So this is why, for instance, we have a tax reform right now in discussion. And that tax reform is seeking to reduce the cost of capital for investors in the country, at least for corporates. And that's the kind of decisions that are not so popular, because th th when you said this, it's not so popular, but at the same time, it's necessary. We need investors to come to Colombia. We need people to want to stay, and we need the uh, investment to, to happen. On those areas, there's no doubt. Forestry is a big opportunity. Mining and oil and mining is a big opportunity. Uh, 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 large agribusiness, industrial agribusiness programs are, are an opportunity. Tourism is an opportunity. Uh, and of course, you know, having a Colombian junk, being a junk country, big market, of course, technology can be attached onto all this. But first and foremost, we need uh, to strengthen our efforts to make the country attractive for long-term investment investors. And I think we, we, we will need to work hard on that. Thank you. So in a moment, uh, the ambassador will be uh, uh, willing to take questions. Um, and we'll put a microphone out here in just a moment um, if people would like to line up uh, to ask questions. But I'd like to put one more question to you, especially thinking about your role right now as ambassador. And it's this, you know, you remarked earlier on the importance of the partnership of the United States, uh, Plan Colombia and the support it provided for earlier stages of uh, moving towards the peace process. What, what assistance do you look for now from the United States? What do you hope the United States, you know, can promise, especially in this moment of peace? You know, there's been talk sometimes of Plan Colombia, Paz Colombia, or something that would try to really work towards um, peace. What would that look like? What would be the strategic things you would hope the United States would do to accompany uh, Colombia in this next stage? Well, thank you very much for that question, because that's the real thing I do now, <laughs> you know? Care for that, you know, and, and focus on to that. First, let me tell you that uh, Colombia will continue to uh, make efforts and, and keep this very important bet of bipartisanship. Uh, that has been very important for Colombia, and we strongly believe into that. We have great friends in both sides of the aisle, and all of them have contributed to different policies of Colombia, from Plan Colombia to the free trade agreement on different times. And we have worked with uh, Democratic and Republican administrations, and we have worked with uh, uh, Democratic and Republican uh, Congresses. And both have been supportive of Colombia. Everybody has put its own flavor on the Colombia-US agenda. But we have learned to adjust, adapt, you know, and take the benefit of having uh, both. By saying that, I think that the idea that was presented last February here, that uh, we use Plan Colombia as the tool to build you know, the, the, the peacemaking process was very important, but now we need a tool that makes peace sustainable. You know, and even without having the agreement signed, you know, we are already in the face of a, a peace transition. So we need that peace transition to be sustainable and to be kept. So of course we're seeking for more money, more money to be uh, uh, invested into uh, the marginal areas of the country that I described for the purpose of development. Of course, we will make the same bet we did before. Colombians, taxpayers put 95% of uh, every, uh, every dollar that, it, that, that gets uh, uh, in the country. So we put 95%, US supports us with some like 5% of the total effort investment. But at the end, that US money usually is very important for the impact of enabling or of kickoff that US flexibility and experience has in the country. We will continue to seek for strengthening justice. Justice will be extremely important in the years to come for, you know, for peacetime. And we will continue to seek for capabilities to confront organized crime. Uh, we are not uh, renouncing to that. Uh, unfortunately, drug trafficking, illegal mining will not vanish of the country. That will be there. We will need to work onto that. And of course, I think 
that is not only for the good of Colombia, but as we work now, is good for Central America, is good for the Caribbean, and even is good for Mexico and the United States. Uh, as much as we can contain crime in Colombia, or even adapt to the new changes that, for instance, in the coca uh, production is happening, coca crops are growing again, so we need to find how to contain that cocaine to come to the United States or that money to come back to Colombia or to cross Central America, that's very important. So the efforts on, on confronting organized crime are not only for the good of Colombia, are you know, a regional strategic aim that is important. So we are seeking for Peace Colombia, the new program, uh, from Plan Colombia to Peace Colombia, as a key element of the strategy to make peace sustainable and you know, continue to have Colombia as a country that can promote and spur democracy, freedom, and somehow move on to the next level. An, an important investment, absolutely. So let's open this up to questions now. Uh, if people would like to form a line here, we can take questions um, from the audience. Uh, looks like we might have some people already coming forward. Yes, please. Not you, Juan Carlos. Senor Urori, see. Si. <laughs> Not you, come on. Hi, Ambassador. Uh, my You're name is Juan Carlos. Me. <laughs> my name is Juan Carlos Iragorri. I'm a Colombian journalist. If there is a new agreement with the FARC, do you think it should be ratified by a, another plebiscite or another referendum? Yes or no? Mr. Iragorri is one of the most prestigious Colombian journalists. You know, he's a, he's very, he's a good man, so he doesn't want to expose himself, but I will expose him as I should. You know, he's, he's a bright man and he knows Colombia very well. I cannot answer that question that way, uh, Juan Carlos, and the reason is simple. I think we're in the middle of uh, different op options. The president, as I described, has the option of signing a new agreement and using all the ordinary tools to proceed. And that's under our constitution and our, under our law. He might come in, uh, with the conclusion that maybe would be good or even the constitutional court can rule, can rule in a future ruling that that needs to be uh, uh, consulted to the people. We don't know that yet. So what is true is that a new agreement is trying to be brewed right now. That's the process in which we are. And the main aim I think the government is trying is to increase the level of consensus about the next agreement and having as much people on board as possible. And then we'll see what comes next. So sorry, Juan Carlos. Please. Hello. Uh, my name is Juan Felipe Cardona. I'm Assistant Director of Executive Programs here at Georgetown, originally from Cali, Colombia. Mm -hmm. And my question has two parts, but they go together. Um, I left Colombia in 2000, 2001, when the country was struggling a lot. My family moved here for safety reasons. But I recently just came back from Medellin. In fact, I was there last week. And it's night and day how much the country has improved. You can see it everywhere. I kept saying this is not the Colombia I grew up in. Uh, and I was very proud of what I saw. So the first thing is, uh, I'm sure you noticed, but yesterday, Lonely Planet named Colombia the number two place to visit in 2017. That's a, a big achievement. And so my first question is, can you please name some initiatives that Colombia is doing to promote foreign tourism to the country? And then the second thing is, uh, for years now, newspapers have been calling Medellin the Silicon Valley of Latin America. And I'm very interested in that. I study entrepreneurship and social innovation. I wanted to know if you can name some organizations that are also promoting entrepreneurship and social innovation in Latin America, specifically with foreign investment and attracting foreign social capital. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And I'm happy you, you're proud of your own country and the way things are going. And as I said, I hope you can find a way to come back, contribute, because we need people you know, to, to not forget. You know, we, we have lessons from, from our own brothers that we need to Keep, keep, keep our eye open to work hard and, 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 and keep moving forward. You, you're right, on, on tourism, th there are many interesting efforts going on. Uh, well, the, the, the first one are the, are the real metrics. The country move of having some like uh, 400,000 people visiting the country uh, 10 years ago to almost 4 million now. And that, that's very substantial. A lot of people is coming, of course, to the, uh, the, the bright spots. So, of course, Cartagena has become a world destiny. Uh, so nice that we Colombians cannot, cannot go so, as often as we, as we did before because it's, it's becoming a, a very nice city, you know, and very, very attractive. Medellin has done on their own 
with the leadership of Medellin, and you know, Medellin requires a lot of recognition for what they as a society have uh, present. They were the most balanced city in the planet. You know, they, they, they were second to none on, on every metric of, of crime and violence. And they have been able to work hard, present the city to the world, invest, particularly the private sector, in innovation initiatives, and somehow attract the attention of the world. Uh, and, you know, there's more people and more people coming to Medellin for business, but a lot of people now is coming for, for tourism. You know, we have ProColombia. ProColombia is our, our agency to promote the country, of course, on investment, trade, and tourism. I think they're, they, the efforts on tourism are, are increasing. There are more direct flights from U.S. cities to Colombia. I, I, I am now benefiting out of them, surprisingly. Not only we have these, just to mention one, the Avianca flight from Bogota to or Washington Dolls to, to, to Bogota, but the other day I, I did a, a fly I, I never expected. I went to Fort Lauderdale and I got Fort Lauderdale Car Cartagena on nonstop flight, you know. Uh, no, that was a JetBlue and a Spirit, both have that, <laughs> you know. So it's surprising, you know. Delta has uh, flights to, to several cities. Uh, from Cali you can do nonstops to the US, uh, uh, to Houston, uh, to Atlanta, to Miami, Fort Lauderdale, New York, LA, uh, Dallas, you know, there are many cities now from the United States just uh, connecting to, to, to Colombia. So I think there, there, there are interesting initiatives. Not to forget the commitment of our, of our public figures, the artists. You know, people like Shakira, like Carlos Vives, Juanes and others, they have made the image of the country uh, as a commitment, you know, and they are trying and they, go and present the country and almost every video they do, they do it on Colombian spaces and environments. So somehow the curiosity about Colombia is growing because of these efforts that somehow ProColombia has been trying to, uh, uh, you know, promote and, 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 you know, move on. And recently I've seen, and that I did even during my time as Minister of Defense, just to recognize here, we have the former commander of the army here, a real hero, you know, and some of his guys is here with me today. But, uh, you know, when, when heroes like him were able to recover that part of the country in the south, Caño Cristales, and other places, entrepreneurial and innovation activity from Colombians is very impressive. So suddenly they were taking already people from Europe and U.S. cities directly to those places, not even, I mean, spending a night in Bogota, but not even getting to know the, the country, just going to these amazing, uh, you know, very, very impressive views that, that are seen there. So I think already things are happening, but the opportunity we have with that is impossible to measure to me right now. I guess, you know, some good investment bankers should be doing good numbers right now and seeking, you know, to see what will happen to tourism to those areas if the country really pacifies and we keep attracting with uh, some benefits for the uh, hospitality industry that are available in Colombia. And that industry has grown a lot as well. I think that's what I can tell you for now, but uh, we should be enthusiastic and, and seeking how to uh, promote that as much as we can. Good afternoon, Ambassador. My question is pretty simple. So. Don't you think that the result of the plebiscite was in the end the result of a political dispute between the two most prestigious or two well-known leaders in Colombia, President Santos and President Uribe? And if so, what do you think President Santos should do to change the path of this political dispute, again, to put it in the terms of uh, to solve the, the problem of peace in Colombia? A lesson I have is never talk of my boss, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I learned that the hard way, but uh, I'm going I'm to try to, to give you some insights. You know, the, the three latest presidents of Colombia, to me, are real leaders and are real patriots and are required to be recognized. Pastrana, Uribe, and Santos need to be recognized to history, and they will have their space in history. Actually, even President Santos already has his Nobel Prize, so he was going to have a, a big space. I think all of them try to do the best for the country when they could, 
and when they have been responsible for. And I think President Santos now is convinced that there's an opportunity for peace and he's playing all his political capital, everything that he hands to make it happen. I think he knows and anybody knows that he has said, this is not going to be perfect. There are a lot of challenges and flaws to the future. But what he sees is that probably we are at front of an opportunity that we cannot waste. Now, of course, it will be great to see everybody on board. And of course, it will be great to see somehow spirits disarm and you know, focusing on these issues. But I think for the good of politics and democracy, it's good to have debate. And it's good to have different opinions. And probably what Colombian people did, more than you know, the confrontation of leaders, was to express that they probably want peace. Everybody said that, the yes and the no. But maybe we can have a better one. And that's, a, I think, the opportunity that is being brewed as we speak. I will tell you, it's not going to be easy, precisely because of the intensity of the political debate. But I think I see it, you know, and I think we should see it. And, and the younger generation should see it clearly. You know, we need to move on. But as I said before, keeping the eye on the ball, working hard, because of course, others might use this for different purposes than the good of Colombia, and to seek the same path we have tried. We need to learn from other lessons, and we need to focus on working and keep you know, attracting investment and keep working to, for growth and keep fighting poverty. Do not allow that to be you know, a, a populist speech. We need to keep advancing as we have proved that uh, we can do it. That will be a little bit of my, my take on that. Señor Embajador, Hola, Padre gusto. Matthew. ¿Qué tal? Um, it's a pleasure. My name is Cecilia Barja. I am from Bolivia, and I've been living in Colombia for six years. I just moved uh, to the States. So, and I have two daughters that are born two in Bogotá, Colombia. So I'm very proud yeah, to well. say that uh, we ourselves can have many nationalities, not only the one, uh, the country for, from where we were born. And actually your invitations for having Colombians moving to Colombia, I think it can be an open invitation for having Latino Americanos moving to Colombia and building the peace process. Peace. Mm -hmm. So um, I have uh, two kind of questions. First, I am a strong believer that uh, peace in Colombia is the most important agenda in Latin America. So how can we have a regional conversation about the peace process in Colombia without immediately jumping in the easy reasoning of left and right? Quien es on the izquierda, quien es on the derecha, and take positions and ideology and have too much of a prejudice. So how can we Latinos move from the easy reasoning of trying to explain ourselves if we're coming from one side or the other side of the aisles, and we can overcome and jump into the next century and what are the origins agenda, instead of trying to um, kind of explain ourselves. That was the first uh, question. And for the last couple of years, I, I have loved your country more than ever. And especially I have loved your country because I have moved out of Bogota. And I was able to work with Red Pro de Paz with the people in the most difficult places of your country. So how can we avoid having the peace process being negotiated in, in Bogota among President Santos and former President Uribe and put more Pueblo into the conversation and having people discuss about the peace process and instead of being a dialogue between the always elite and becoming more of a conversation among the people? Well, th thank you for the question and thank you for the interest uh, and, and commitment about Colombia. Sure, I think the, the area has concluded that advancing in the efforts of uh, pacifying Colombia is good for the region, is good for uh, Latin American in general terms. And I think uh, the country has uh, accepted uh, and, and, and is willing actually to continue to raise this uh, regional support. But I think we cannot be uh, naive on the effectiveness of some models and the failures of others. And I think peace in Colombia should mean that we should keep moving on the right side of the story in terms of reducing poverty, growing the economy, 
and giving more opportunities for the people. There are many other models in Latin America that unfortunately have proven to be failing or have failed already. And I think we should be aware of that because it's important to have this open dialogue and this will to embrace everybody and this will of Latin America to, you know, everybody be on the same page as we should. You know, at the end we're same nation, if I can put it in a way. But let's not forget uh, about the failures and use the mirrors on one hand and on the other side, not bring people to fail promises. You know, we have seen that a lot in Latin America. You know, that uh, different governments and different places uh, come and tell that now we know how we're going to solve problems and suddenly they start with an ideological agenda that ends into more poverty, more complications, and frankly, not advancement. I think there are models in the region as well that have proven to be very advanced, very effective, and I would share with you, as much people as you can include in the democracy for the debate, for the opinion, is wonderful. And more important than all, as much as we can consider the agenda of fighting poverty, reducing inequality, and giving opportunities, not a party or not a sector agenda, but a national agenda, because you have to, I think those are the kind of consensus we need to keep building on. And, and I'm, frankly speaking, I, I, I feel very committed to, to that kind of vision uh, as, as a person. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, Ambassador. Uh, my name is Manuel Rojas. I am an officer, ex-officer of Colombian Army. I served for 10 years. And I wanted to ask you about the results of the plebiscite. In the results, uh, the, uh, after the results, October 14th, the New York Times uh, stated that Alvaro Uribe is the man blocking the agreement. Uh, one day after, the political party claimed themselves the, the winners, and actually Colombians in the march and many too much social media are, are questioning if they are the owners or not of the result. What do, what do you think about it? Do you agree on this? Uh, well, first, my respect for your service to, to the country. Thank you for, for your service to the army and, and I'm sure you big things. Well, your question is not an easy one because we are at a time in which everybody is giving opinions. We Colombians are extremely opinionated. That's one of the <laughs> things that characterize our will to democracy and our uh, joy to democracy. So every time you talk to a Colombian, each of us uh, will have its own vision and its own solution to the uh, issues of the country and a strong view. But if that were not enough, now we have everybody doing an op-ed on Colombia, <laughs> you know? And now there are a lot of opinions uh, with different perspectives and views. My position on this is we respect everybody and we like everybody to uh, give us ideas and those are welcome. But I think we need to solve our political process the way we're doing this, uh, which is first, there's a political result that was uh, not only strongly accepted by the president, but has led him to a new challenge, which is having a new agreement and listening to everybody, and that's what he's doing. And second, of course, allowing our democracy to uh, move on and, and, and get to the, to the discussions. I don't think anyone can claim, especially in a democratic system, an individual particular victory. And I will be very blunt on this. Many people that voted for the yes, definitely they don't like the FARC and they don't share everything uh, on the agreement, but they want to move to peace. And definitely, it's not true that everybody who voted for a no is because they wanted war or because they support a specific leader. It's because they disagree with some things. I think the majority of Colombians care for willing to peace, hoping for peace, and working for that. And of course, what we need to find now is an equilibrium of what is the agreement that majority will think is the most acceptable 
and the best possible one. That's what President Santos is working right now. You know, that's the mandate people gave him, you know, after the plebiscite. Get a new agreement and somehow try to make it as legitimate, as inclusive for Colombian opinion as, as possible. That's what I see. And I know the ambassador is on a very tight schedule, but I think we could take one last question, so please. Thank you very much. Uh, ambassador, thank you very much. My name is Angelo Spina. I work as a Colombian trade advisor uh, in the Colombia mission to the EU. Uh, actually, uh, seeing the country from outside raised a lot of questions from the professional and from the personal uh, perspective. I, I have observed that in Colombia, a lot of questions arise and a lot of words arise about forgiveness, about reconciliation. It was not thought even 10 or 20 years ago, but now it is very uh, plausible. So what do you think is the most uh, biggest challenge, the biggest challenge for the policy makers and for the leaders in Colombia in order to uh, convert that uh, it is now we had an, a Colombia that is debated in and is fractionated in some opinions but we need to put everyone in the same table for example if you see now Germany even if Germany is one there is a lot of division between what is the West and what is the East I don't want that Colombia become in that way because if a time happened uh, passed and we are going to have uh, the ex guerrilla and the Colombians I mean, we need to change that, and this is a very important moment to think our country, I mean, this is a, a breaking point. So what do you think will be our biggest challenge to put everyone in an only one society? Thank you very much. So you see, we need you back, first of all. You see? Yeah. You see why? I am optimistic. <laughs> I am sure that we are going to get You one. have to, and we need to work together, you know, thinking like that. Reconciliation is challenging, and we Colombians have reconciled by trenches is what I would say, because as I said before, we have 60 mobilizations already. For us, it's not surprising to see a senator that was a former guerrilla member or a mayor of a city that was a former guerrilla member. It happens to us. I remember some time ago, uh, I was asked, would you ever give the hand to a member of a guerrilla? I said, look, I think I give the hand to more members of a guerrilla than any people that I know, with the exception of the military, maybe General Las Prilla, because we demobilize them Four by day. So commanders of the FARC came to us, commanders of the ELN, you know, the, the very basic uh, guerrilla members came for protection of the state, you know. So reconciliation can be possible, but can be possible, of course, with a settlement of rules and agreements, you know, that need to be respected and need to give comfort, as has been trying Colombia to the victims first and foremost, but then to the set of values of the country. And I think this is what we are, as I said, brewing right now. But it will take a generation. When I said we will need to work hard and this is going to be challenging, believe me, we don't have the elixir, nobody has that. You know, the, the elixir of, of peace and reconciliation and uh, problem solving. We have a major economic challenge. We have a major challenge to develop our infrastructure, to make the policies effective. And even we have the challenge to be able to live without harm, which has not been the history of Colombia. So look at the challenge we have. And yes, why I'm optimistic as you are? Because we have a lot of people more and more educated. I told before to a group of uh, uh, members of Port Colombia, by the way, thank you for bringing me here. I'm here because of you and, and appreciate the, the invitation. Thanks. Uh, but I was telling them, every time I go now to any American school, to any major US corporate, you don't imagine how many Colombians come out. You know, the level of people, of the numbers of people that is being educated, I should, I'm supposed to know the numbers. I'm the ambassador to the US. I don't know the numbers, to be very honest. <laughs> Only thing I know is that everywhere I go, if I go to the School of Engineering of Utah University, or if I go to Georgetown today, or any school, suddenly you will see Colombians thinking about the country, hoping to return, and hoping to add. And that's, I think, the power we need to use for the years to come. I guess that most of these Colombians that are coming out, 
will have several advantages. Of course, their education and a framework of mm -hmm. doing things, you know, with international standards, that's good. Competitiveness. But one very important thing, the possibility of seeing the country from the outside and, and, be, and become critic. But at the same time, understanding that you can solve problems uh, having difference by having a conversation. I think that's a little bit of what I foresee and that's a big uh, opportunity. We need to keep our consensus. And of course, I am the natural advocate for the consensus of security. And I will be forever. I will be the advocate forever of two things. Recognition to our military and police because they deserve a recognition. Many of them were killed to serve us and to put us where we are. Many of them lose their legs and their lives forever just because uh, they were serving to us. But on the other hand, I will advocate for security. There is no way, and I'm going to tell you the truth, there is no way you can create development in those marginal areas if people is having fear or feeling fear of someone or of something. You know, and that's very important. People need to feel protected. We need to extend the feeling of protection. Protection is not always having a bodyguard or having an armed structure to confront others. Protection sometimes is to guarantee a set of rules, an environment, options for the people. And we need to work on to that. That's, that's the key years to come. Thanks. Embajador, gracias. And by way of closing, let me say that we could not be more proud to have so many Colombians here as students. Thank you. Uh, we, they are incredibly valued members of our community who make us better as a community. And you know, Georgetown has this incredibly deep commitment to Latin America. It's something that goes back to our founding. It's something that's received new, a new energy in recent years through the, the energy and the excitement of the Latin American board through the long work of our um, uh, investment study and our Center for Latin American Studies, and recently through the sponsor of this particular day, the Latin America Initiative, which is a university-wide initiative to really deeply um, engage the region. And what I hope the students that are here have gained, and when you said, you know, I, I really appreciate it, you said, go and get the perspective from outside and bring it back. And I hope that we take back, or our students take back, a particularly Georgetown perspective. Um, and it's one thing that I hope for for Columbia. You know, our motto here um, is a Latin phrase. It's utraque unum. And it comes from uh, St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, where he's talking about how two people that had been divided in his time, Jew and Greek, slave and free, were somehow made one. And that motto became important for Georgetown right after the Civil War in this country, when we tried to, to unite gray and blue, these two um, warring armies. And that has been a model that stuck with us, and it's, in a sense, our greatest uh, aspiration, that reconciliation might be found, that justice might be found, but that ultimately might unity might be found. So my great hope for today is that we started some of that conversation about how Georgetown can contribute to that and how we can walk alongside Columbia as it seeks that kind of unity and that kind of peace. Oh, thank so you thank you very much. Very generous of those words. Thank you yes. so much. Thank you.